Delighted to be here today. Uh, delighted to um, have a chance to talk to you a little bit about generative AI and education technology and just where it's all going. So I've been involved in education technology for about 25 years now. Um, and um, both as a researcher, as a user, educator in Trinity, I ran all of uh, education technology in Trinity for about 10 years, introduced it within the university. And as a spin out company, we span out uh, education technology in, sim in simulation about 10 years ago, and that got acquired for about 50 million a couple of years ago. So I'm kind of seeing this from different different perspectives. So just in the audience, just if you put up your hands and let me know, are you, are you working for, with uh, education technology within your company or is your company uh, one of the education technologists company? Just, just to get to your kind of roles. How many people here are involved in education or teaching in some way? Okay, as users. Um, and then f finally, how many people are just using Gen AI to get their jobs done during the day? Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to talk about all three of those um, and try and look and see wh where it's going and what's happening. It is the fastest moving area of artificial intelligence um, across the world. It's also the fastest moving technology across the world. And we're going to talk about why and we'll talk about what, where it's going. So as John said, I'm from uh, the ADAPT Center, and what differentiates us from a lot of other research centers in, in AI around the world is what we try and do is be human-centric. What that means is we're actually looking at the technology and how it empowers an individual, rather than us being automated by the technology, which is not just uncomfortable, but actually is, is, is not going to be successful in the future, and we'll see why. So today I want to talk about what is generative AI. I'm just aware that if I stand here, you can't see the slides. If I stand here, it's probably better. Is that okay? Um, what is generative AI? Because a lot of people talk about it, and they all talk about what it does, not what it is. Um, I wanted to, put it, uh, to pull the covers back a little bit. It's not magic, okay? And it's not that difficult to understand either. Um, how is it impacting industry and why? Um, it is the, the fastest moving technology, so we want to know a little bit about why. If you understand that, you understand how to protect yourself and then how to make use of it. Think of it as a wave coming in, you don't want to be side on, you want to be, be able to go over that wave and surf it. And then finally, how does it actually work under the covers? Um, what is it currently, well, how is it currently being used in education? Um, is a really hot question at the moment. Um, and again, there's an awful lot of rumor and so forth. I'm going to try and give, uh, provide some clarity in exactly where it's going and, and, and how it's being used. What are the risks and challenges? Um, Generally speaking, if you read an article, you can tell where, it's, where the author is coming from. Either they'll start with the risks or they'll start with the benefits, but rarely will they give you both. So I'm going to try and get you both in, within one half hour presentation. And then finally, where is it going? Um, if, I don't know if people even have heard, but like there's, there's new announcements from ChatGPT called uh, Student GPT. There's a new announcement from uh, Google called Gemini Education Spaces. These are happening literally days apart now. Um, so what exactly does that mean for us going forward? And how can we actually then be informed to be able to be doing it the right way? So first of all, what is generative AI? It's part of AI. It's part of machine learning. It's a particular part within deep learning. And right in the bottom, generative AI is using all of those deep learning techniques to do what? Well, what a generative AI stands for is generating content. So a lot of the old, and sorry for those in data analytics, for the older people who use the data analytics, it's very much about discovering patterns and discovering. Gen AI is all about actually predicting forward and generating content. That's where its names come from. It will generate text, image, video, speech, conversation. It'll generate data for your data analytics, synthetic data. It will generate it in all different ways. The way I kind of describe it is think of content now being like liquid and you having a glass. It will take whatever shape your glass is, have whatever uh, taste you want and be able to satisfy whatever thirst you have. That's what Gen AI is trying to do. Now, there is some problems with that. You want it to be correct. You want it to be truthful. You want it to be trustworthy. We'll talk about them as we go forward. Um, it is very eloquent, even when it gets it wrong. It's very convincing, okay? So it will absolutely tell you something that's completely false, and give you references that don't exist, okay? But what's happening is since the, uh, since it's, it's 
really hit the marketplace in about 2021, 2022, it's actually improved an awful lot on its accuracy. And again, I'm going to show you some of that. And there's a huge range of application types. So any sort of questions and answers, any sort of administrative and marketing communications, any sort of customer and supplier communications, any sort of process knowledge and exchange, any sort of training and staff development, and where it's now moving, any R&D. It will generate suggestions for your products. It will generate suggestions for your compounds if you're doing chemicals. I mean, that's the kind of level it's moving into, okay? Um, the one I always worry about uh, is the new job that people have is called uh, influencers and social media influencers. The, think about it, social media influencers, all they do is generate content. Gen AI generates content. Could you imagine uh, social influence with this? Um, so it will actually go into all of these areas and is going into all of these areas. And that's also why companies are kind of feeling a little bit uncomfortable because every, every department is being uh, impacted by this. So why is it different? Well, previous automation technologies tend to focus on automating uh, low-level manual processes, whether it be in the factories, whether it be in manufacturing, whether it be at, at the office level, at routine, admi routine administration. Generative AI is actually focused on the knowledge worker. It's particularly good involving decision-making and collaboration, and where it's really, really focused on, it's really about making the knowledge worker more productive making that knowledge worker be able to make faster decisions, get the right information at the right time in what the way they want to use it and move it forward. So when you think about it, actually, it's, it's operating at a different level in terms of the organization. That means it has much more uh, a chance to have a much broader impact. It will do text generation, speech, text to speech, image to image, text to image. It will do it all for, uh, for you. The other part that's unusual is that, that as humans, the only thing we ever talk to are other humans. I mean, we talk to our dog. We don't expect our dog to answer back, okay? Well, not much, okay? And we might talk to our car, but that really doesn't do much use. But actually, but with, with the generative AI, it will talk back to you, and it will behave as a human. And our brains are conditioned to be able to, without realizing it, think of it as a human. Even it's called automorphism. And even though we don't, we know it's not real, so we begin to have the expectations that they'll behave somehow as a human might. So we've got to be very careful with that within, within Gen AI. And we're seeing that some companies are deliberately trying to muddy the waters there. Um, I think it was anyone's looked at the newspaper today, but anyone here about the, the problems that's, uh, is it Scarlett Johansson? Yeah, you know, and uh, the uh, synthetic voice that ChatGPT has now come out with sounds very like Scarlett Johansson from her, the movie. Um, they've apologized and they've just re retracted it, but it gives you an idea of just where they're going on this. So why is it quite different? Well, it's the fastest adopted technology ever in history. Um, to get to 100 million users, it only took two months. Compare that to TikTok, which took nine months, and we're all so over TikTok. It's everywhere, right? So if it's that fast, what's, well, why and why? Second thing is, humans conduct business and social activities through conversation, and the interfaces are uh, intuitive and efficient. In computer science, we call it frictionless. It means it's so easy to use. If you can speak, if you have a language, you can use Gen AI. And what happens then is you start using it, you realize actually the more I cleverly use it for my questions, the better it produces the answers for me. So there is no manual. Um, the other part that people may, may have a false assumption on is that, well, I don't really want to talk to a computer. Actually, when the studies go, they find people actually do prefer because computers or chatbots, they're available 24-7, so they're there when you need them. They don't judge you. We all have that fear. They don't, um, if, if you don't understand it, you can say, I don't want to explain that again, and it doesn't get upset. Okay? So it is endlessly patient, 24-7 uh, available, non-judgmental, and reasonably accurate. 
So you can see why actually people will begin to use these things much more. Uh, and we're seeing it in, from the healthcare in, 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 in very sensitive areas as well. Okay. So um, McKinsey did a report in 2023. Where are the big areas that Gen AI is actually being used, right? So the big five are sales, marketing, software engineering, customer operations, and product R&D. Okay. That's about 70, in, in 2023, that was about 75% of the use of Gen AI in those spaces. And it was transforming them. Um, the one that people are really surprised about was product R&D. Hang on a second, these things are dumb, aren't they? They just generate language. They can't be creative. Yes, they can. Depends what you mean by creative. It can connect different things together. It can do massive suggestions and move forward and see what they could be. So this thing actually is really, really powerful. Um, what are the areas within organizations? Or the, uh, the high tech space is, is, is uh, probably the one. If you look at education, it's not anywhere near as uh, impacted in, by 2023. I always thought that figure was slightly low because I'm seeing now lots of companies beginning to do this. It took a bit longer to, um, to train the to systems and to, to, to begin to uh, produce product, but it's now appearing. So the education space is, a, is now becoming much more competitive for the use of Gen AI. Corporate benefits, what's happening? Well, we're seeing productivity increases, okay? So productivity, depending on who you talk to, will increase between 10% and 30%. That's profit. That's the same people, and you do 30% more work. Okay? But another way, Gen AI may not take your job, but someone using Gen AI will. Okay? Because they're going to be much more efficient and productive. Don't get scared. You can use it too. But you know, have to know how to use it and know where to use it and so forth. So, and, and th these... There's multiple um, reports on, on, on this productivity. Some of the productivity actually is quite interesting. Some of the productivity is where the user is not very experienced. So it's providing a lot of help that the user wouldn't normally have and get their job done, activity done faster. Other sides where the person is expert, they're just using it to get started. They're just using it to, oh, yeah, I can just, I, I'll, I'll get it to generate and then I'll just fix it. Um, so. We're seeing it from both, both ends of the spectrum, both uh, experienced people and uh, in their jobs and um, uh, the, the, the newer. Making faster decision making, um, task completion, um, making content production faster. Uh, in the software engineering um, area, we're noticing that teams of eight programmers are now becoming six, Gen AI being the seventh. Now, what's interesting is they're beginning to cop on that they actually need somebody else in the team now who looks after Gen AI <laughs> to make sure it's being used the right way. Or if you're a software company, you're not giving away your IP by accidentally giving it uh, your software to Gen AI to fix the mistakes. And then you find that your software is, being, is, is elsewhere in the network. Um, it's making content production much faster. I mean, it's not as if we're not already overloaded with content. <laughs> Now, so sometimes I kind of go, well, do we really want that? But, but it is becoming much faster to get out much more high quality content uh, using this approach. And it's lowering the cost of dealing with customers. And that's the other big one. Because what's happening is you're, you're actually uh, interacting with customers in a much more deeper way with these. Um, you're able to service them before they actually land on your, your um, call centers or in your in, in your. Um, uh, in your uh, employees' desk, on your employees' desks. Um, and the engagement is much more richer because these things can be very polite, can be very helpful, can uh, um, give the right answers at the right time in the right place. So how does it work? I'm gonna be really quick. Everyone's heard this word language model and large language model. How many people actually have, know what it is? Okay, that's what I guessed. So very, very quickly, Large language models are not facts. There is no fact in them. There is no right and wrong. There is no moral, moral judgments. There is nothing like that. All it is, is that the first state, it represents every word as a number. But it represents it compared to or close to other numbers. So for example, if I have a CEO and a COO, they're concepts that are quite close. So you can expect them in a 
a language model to be represented by numbers relatively similar or have connections. Now, we have a massive vocabulary. So I, I like using my arms, but I can't do the, move this. Um, we have a massive vocabulary. So actually, we have lots of numbers representing each word and the connections to them all. That's the first part of a language model. Okay? So we represent them as massive matrices, okay? or, or vectors, if you want. Okay? But that's not what the actual uh, executable is. The executable, then, is taking all of these bits of text, representing them, and then building and then building an AI or neural network which predicts what the next word would be. Now, we think about that. That seems mad. And to be honest with you, as AI people, around about 2020, we thought, this can't work, really? Um, and we, we saw it we first working, and we kind of went, it's kind of spuddy. It's kind of awkward. It's, it's not quite right. But actually, it's, it's getting closer. What happens is if you have that amount of vocabulary and you're training this network over that vocabulary, trying to predict what word comes next in what context. And these in 2018, uh, a new architecture for it called Transformer came in, which not only looked at the word, but also looked at the word in its placing in the sentence and, what, and its connections with even with the words in the sentence. It then began to predict really accurately what the next word would be. So that's all the model is. The model is a predictor of your next word. Okay? But it has so much context, so much uh, information about the words themselves, that it's making reasonable predictions. Now, human, what we think that can't happen. Actually, that's what's happening. That's, what's, that's where the, the, the content's coming from. But if it's trained on enough pieces of data and trained on enough massive amount of information, it can do that. The other part that, that people uh, don't get right is that this model that's producing these productions, predictions doesn't contain any words. It's no longer the word model, it is a predictor, it is a neural network. Now, the ones you might have heard of was ChatGPT or GPT-4 now, Gemini, Lambda, uh, you might have heard of, of, of Anthropix one, um, Claude, and Dali was the one who uh, is, produces images. I'm not going into detail, there's different ways of, 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 of training them, but the ones that you're more familiar with are the ones that actually produce the, um, the prediction of the, of the, of the data. What it can be used for is text generation, question and answering, machine translation, summarization, classification, sentiment analysis, content creation, and I could go on. How does it work? Well, as I said, when we looked at them here, and John will admit to this, it wasn't great, it was okay, it was a bit sticky. Suddenly got our attention. Actually eloquent. Um, and reasonably accurate. And the accuracy is improving the whole time. But you can see how much data that it has to have. And you also have to see how much, how big those models are. Um, 1.7576 trillion parameters. Parameters in, are the little weights within the neural network, um, if anyone's interested. But it, it costs a huge amount of time and a huge amount of money to train them. I think we're talking about 100 million to train a, a decent sized foundational model. And that's why, at the top end, these are all the big companies, because that's where the investment is. Okay. Uh, you've got Lambda, GPT, uh, Gemini, and Claude, probably being the, the, the major ones. All these slides will be available if anyone wants them later, no problem. Um, yeah, and, and you can see the kind of money, it's 100 million and so forth. For these, they're called foundation models because they're models of language and lots of information, general information. Uh, what are they trained on? They're trained on everything from the internet. So Reddit, uh, white papers, uh, appropriate content, uh, all of that stuff. Um, the John tells me that by about 2028, we might run out of data that's quality annotated because these things are getting so big. So just to keep you, your, your head together, if that hasn't totally blown you. So in the here, we have these foundational models. And we have other knowledge model, knowledge that's in your organization. I haven't forgotten that. That comes at the end. You're here just using an app, but that's all what's behind you. And what that means is you can start doing this much faster. You can do pursuing new markets. You can enhance products. You can uh, uh, imagine new processes. You can generate communication because this thing is helping you generate that content for you. Um, anyone who's been using it and sees this, they kind of go, 
well, maybe I'm not using it right. I could use it more. That's the usual reaction, okay? Current role in education, because this is about education. So productivity improvements, what we're seeing straight away is that people who are in education are already using it. So teachers are already using it. We reckon it's about 56% of the school teachers in Ireland. Um, checking things up. I'll talk about the, what they're doing. Um, students, I can talk about Trinity-ish. Um, 60 to 80% of students at least are using it. For, we've sat, we, we, we did some, um, a colleague here, Brendan, we did some very kind of uh, um, early uh, questions to students. What were they using it for and where were they using it? They're using it in our lectures to explain something that the lecturer might have said, but they didn't understand at the time. They're using it just in time. They're using it for, for, for revision. They're using it to test themselves. They're using it in loads of different ways. When we asked our first years, um, how are they using it? And, and how, do they feel confident on it? Well, they went, oh, yes, I've been using it in school. Because two years ago, it came out. And they've been using it since in school kids. So the students are already using it. Tutor, individual tutoring and feedback. Rapid learning and knowledge exchange because you get the information, you can pass it on. Making learning content production faster and less expensive. It's obvious. Uh, and assisting in activity planning. So, for example, when we talk to teachers, lesson plans are one of the things that takes up a lot of time. It can generate different lesson plans and they can say, this is the kind of lesson plan I want. I want it for this person, this kind of profile or whatever. And it can generate it for them. So, actually, it's, it's one of these aids. What a, a lot of the teachers, what a lot of the educators have told us is, I don't use it natively from it. I get it as a starting spot and then I can fix it because I know what I really want. But what they're doing is it, it gives them that kind of fast start. Okay, so from a student's perspective, what are they actually using for? Well, we, we, in formal education, we're using, they're using it for personal tutoring. In other words, learning about things. Um, they're using it for explaining things, summarizing, suggesting how to do things, generating candidate answers for themselves. They're using it for correcting and critiquing their own answers. Uh, they're using it if you're a uh, uh, non-English first language person, uh, uh, you're using it to also correct your language and make it, and, and make it uh, more understandable. We're seeing it all the time. Um, it's also begun to be used for proactive student support, nudges, support messages, uh, reminding of, 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 of uh, deadlines, all that kind of stuff that are, has a high administrative burden. We're seeing Gen AI doing that on behalf of, um, for the students. And language learning, because these things, by the way, are multilingual. From a teacher's perspective, they're uh, being used for generating content for the teachers. So things like uh, examples. We know that we, we need examples. And we know we need, when we're trying to teach concepts, we need examples in different contexts, because we don't know which context is going to hit with the students. Right? So it'll generate that. It'll generate images. It'll generate revision questions. It'll generate quick quizzes, lesson plans. It will distill student uh, responses. So for example, if I had a, was using Slido or something, and I asked you all to give me your top three um, opinions on Gen AI, I can get Gen AI to instantly analyze all of and come back with a word cloud or come back with some sort of graphic to show exactly what the opinion is. And that's just with, that's not me writing any code. So what you can use this for is, is, is again, content now becomes liquid. Um, it'll generate feedback and assessment. It'll, it'll assess answers too. I'm going to talk about assessment later um, because that does come up in the risks. Um, school administration, we're seeing it in, and, and by school, I mean edu any education uh, provider administration. Uh, used for questions and answers about the, about the uh, organization, uh, school admin guides and so forth, questionnaires, information feedback, all of that generated. Things that would normally take the administrators a long time to do, this thing can, can get them out within an hour or two. Um, and then generate feedback. So that's just looking at what people are saying. So Gen AI tools for education. So we're seeing more and more of these come out. So the ones at the moment that you, you're very familiar with is ChatGPT. 4.5. Uh, Gemini uh, has had a, a mixed, slightly rocky start, um, but uh, it, it is becoming established. Lambda, you might probably, Lama, you probably not have heard as much. That's the uh, 
um, Facebook one or the Meta one. That one is designed to be more chatty because it's designed to be used within uh, or, or with uh, social media. And Claude 2 is, is another one, a foundational model from, from on topic. And basically, they all pretty much work the same. You've got a user, you've got an app, which gives you a front end where you can either speak to uh, using voice, voice recognition or you type and text. And it's generating what we call prompts to the large language model, to this, this uh, generative AI uh, neural network. Uh, it's providing, it, it, based on those prompts, it provides responses, and that's what you're seeing. And a prompt can be any form of question or command. So here's one that I did for ChatGPT. I said, who is the best rugby player or who's the best rugby team in the world? Um, and I asked this last February before, before the Six Nations, being a rugby fan, um, hoping that Ireland would appear and ChatGPT didn't even mention us. By the way, we were second in the world at that stage. Didn't even mention us. Talked about generally it's the best, New Zealand is pretty good. New Zealand weren't even in the top two. With South Africa and Ireland was. And then it mentioned South Africa and England and France, and we still didn't get a mention. Okay. So that was Chat TV 3.5, and that was only last February, right? Asked the same question last night. Now look at what it's done. It says South Africa is widely recognized. It's given me references with a rugby pass and, and rugby world. We've checked if they actually those things would exist. Um, and uh, Wikipedia. So what it's doing, it's, it's, what the answers it's giving is actually correct uh, and much more accurate. So what you're seeing there is what's happening is that the, the companies are working really hard to make these uh, language models much more accurate and much more um, referenceable or, 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 or checkable. Um, I say that deliberately because we all tend to think that articles in the newspaper six months ago were probably still a correct. They're not, okay? This is moving that fast, okay? So yes, we do have a problem with, we call them hallucinations, and I'll explain why we call them hallucinations when, when the, the, the language model gets it wrong. But uh, the, the, the levels, the speed at which this is improving is, is, is quite surprising. Here's another example. Ask me five quick uh, revision questions evaluating mathematical expressions, and it just generates them for you, gives you the answer, and you can try it out yourself. Okay, so you know, from a teacher's perspective, from from an educator perspective, these are the kind of things that that it, that it can help you do, and this is how the students are using them at the moment. Okay, as study aids, um, and you can see then actually this prompt creation becomes important because it doesn't even have to be a single query. So, tell me who does this? Okay, based on that, what should I do next? You can actually have a conversation that way, and they will connect those answers together and give you a more filtered response. So you can have a dialogue with it. Here's another example. Uh, summarize the story below uh, in one paragraph. Um, sure. And, and then I just gave, I, I pasted in the three little pigs, about five pages long. And it generated a one paragraph, which actually had all the salient points. So again, this thing is, is, is very, very powerful. It's treating uh, 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 content like liquid. Um, and I've focused on text, but it does sim for images. So what kinds of prompts can you do? Well, you can do a text completion prompt, like the dog ran fast because. So let's imagine you have a particular piece of, of, of information you want, but you want it to, to be expanded and explained. You can do it that way. You can give it an instruction uh, to say, give me such and such an answer, but give me the five top five points in this. Or give me a MC, um, three options to do of how I might solve this. And it will do it. It will give you multiple choice prompts. It'll give you contextual prompts, uh, meaning that it, uh, you can have uh, iterative questions to the uh, uh, language model, and it will combine them together for you as part of a dialogue. And finally, we can actually say, you know what, I want you to answer this problem, but I want you to use these documents. So if that's your own corporate information or your, your, the, your, your favorite books on SQL or, or statistics or whatever it might be you're trying to teach or whatever the educational area is, whatever the process is, you can actually use your own content and it will favor that content over, over uh, the stuff that it's covered. Um, it can be quite what we would consider to be imaginative. So for example, I asked ChatGPT, what is democracy? And it gave me the standard boring, dry description of a democracy. They're important, but they are dull. So I said, suppose you're explaining this to a 10-year-old. What's a democracy? 
imagine that democracy is a big playground where everyone gets to have a say, and then it goes to. Now, we would normally associate that with imagination. It's actually not, it's just associated with words and so forth. But it gives you an idea that actually this just isn't cutting and pasting. This just isn't regurgitating documents. This is actually composing. Risks and challenges. Okay, so everybody sitting here now should sound, probably believe I'm an absolute card carrying uh, proponent of Gen AI. No, there are real risks and we need to be prepared. Okay. The first one I've already alluded to, we call it hallucination. It's called hallucination simply because there are no facts in a language model. All they are is similarities of words. Really good example, and Linda, the provost, allows me to say this one. So I used to, I was teaching a digital uh, engagement course uh, for the university, and I said, look, you know, so who is Vinnie Wade? Uh, and I came up with my CV, and I was very nice. And at the end of the day, and he's CEO of Trinity College Dublin. Bit embarrassing, completely wrong, um, but at the time I was CEO of ADAPT, right? Um, and it was it had, had associated CEO, ADAPT, Trinity. For that, it was a simple connection. Thank you. So I, he just promoted me. Um, so that's what I mean. We call it hallucination. Now, uh, if Jeff Hinton, who's the person who originally developed the uh, AI algorithms in um, neural networks that we use, he prefers to call it confabulation because what's, what's happening is words are being combined together to give you what turns out to be an incorrect fact. But that's the problem. It can do that. And you know what? It does it very convincingly because it sounds right. Um, not for me being CEO of Trinity. Um, the lack of specificity. Um, we, we've seen this more and more times. It doesn't like to get it wrong, so sometimes it'll just stay a little bit general. It's expensive to train uh, if you're uh, one of the people who are offering that model. Uh, it's expensive and effortless to customize, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then it's deductive reasoning that can be quite weak. Um, so, for example, if someone had five apples and they gave four to them and three to them, and then this was done, how many apples do you have? If that's embedded in language, it's, it, it can have difficulties actually working that sort of, that, that sort of induction out. Longer term issues are more significant. We're not convinced about its inclusiveness and bias because we know that it's used real world data and real world data is bias. If real world data is bias, you can guarantee the, these models are too. Second, a lot of those big models are closed. You've no idea what they've been training on. You've no idea um, uh, where, the, the, where the bias has come from. Little kind of anecdote, we don't know for sure, but we think that ChatGPT is using some countries in Africa to train some of its, or, or human correct some of its English, because there are certain phrases which are particularly popular in Nigeria that we're now seeing GPT come out with. Okay. That's just an example of the kind of bias that can emerge. Robustness. AI can behave unpredictably in new or changing circumstances. The AI model, the neural network, is end-to-end, -end, meaning that if I give this input, this is going to be the output. However, what happens is that the, the companies retrain them to improve them. So when you ask the same question after it's been retrained, you get a different answer or you could get a different answer. And that can be upsetting. Um, interpretability, interpret, interpretability whew, that was easy, um, and transparency. Doesn't always explain how it got to where it's, uh, and the inner workings are difficult. That's, that's a total research question at the moment still. Uh, risk evaluation and oversight. So I'm gonna talk a little about the regulations within Europe that, has, that have come in to try and protect against some of that. But who, checks that the, the models are correct. Who checks that the models are not, not giving us the wrong answers and so forth. And intellectual property and infringement. Two things, if you're using them and you're giving any of your customers information to them, you've just broken GDPR, okay? Because you probably don't have the right to be giving that information to somebody else, okay? So how it's being used becomes suddenly really, really important. Same if you're using, uh, uh, you know, for those people using for coding, particularly where they upload their code and ask GPT to correct them, to correct that code. You've just given away your IP. Okay. Now, GT, G, GPT will claim that they're not, but if you look at the contracts, it's not as clear as, we, as, as one would like. A lot of companies are taking that very, very seriously. 
longer term challenges. Um, sorry, this one. Broader fears. Are we making the humans appendages of the super intelligence? In other words, if this thing is that sharp and it will make decisions fast, are we becoming agents of it rather than it working for us? Is the existential concern. Um, at the moment, no. But actually, one can see that actually, you know, maybe you've got a CEO who do, look, does the front of house and you've got a, a Gen AI doing the managing of everything below it. You know, not, not what you want, but we have to be careful. It is displacing in jobs. Because of this productivity, they, you don't need as many people. But what, and anyone who's been in the IT industry long enough recognizes this, when you bring in a new technology, what happens is it creates new roles. The problem with Gen AI is it's come in so fast that we haven't even identified what those roles are. And we're only beginning to now. And so what's happening is that as people have said, okay, great productivity, I'm, I won't have to do this, I won't have to do them, my smaller teams and so forth. And then they realize as they're using it, they now have to have somebody who does quality much more, or someone looks after Gen AI, or someone looks after, so the whole thing, you know, it, it does evolve. So it's not, it just, what it does is it changes jobs roles. It's what it's really gonna do. Regulation. So Europe took the stand. It took the stand in GDPR and it got pillared for it across, Europe, across the world, USA, uh, um, Asia and so forth always said you shouldn't be doing that because you know, you're going to stifle innovation and so forth Europe took the stand and actually turned out to be right we do need to protect individuals their data is important and they should have the right to be forgotten the right to have it corrected and all of that um, because Gen AI can use that data it affects it what uh, Europe did then in, in, in this year was adopt uh, AI legislation called the AI Act it's a political agreement about technology, and it comes into force in two years. And what it's basically saying is taking a risk-based approach, a risk management-based approach to Gen AI. And what it's saying is it can be used in certain places and not in other places or not without being regulated. So it has a number of areas where you're just not allowed to make Gen AI make the decisions. Okay, not allowed. Second was, uh, if it's a high-risk area, it means a human has to be involved it can't just make the decision. One of those high risk areas is education. It's, so it's defined in the act. Other ones are, are specific uh, transparencies required that can be done within the industry itself. So education and vocational training is considered a high risk app. Okay, what does that mean? That means that if anyone develops an educational app using Gen AI, there is going to be regulation and regulation support, uh, or regulation required. However, it's only part of education. So it's really focused on assessment. If Gen AI and AI is assessing a student by itself, then you must have a human in the, in the loop and you must have some element of, um, of, of uh, regulation on that in case it, 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 it treats them unfairly. Where is it going? And I promise I'll go, I should be speeding up fast. So sorry, I'm, I'm probably a bit late. Um, where's the future impacts? Okay, so first thing is multiple systems vendors are now building conversational agents that add value or add functionality. Myself and John are only talking about this literally at the, at the break. Uh, you're seeing uh, announcements by um, Google that they have these Gemini education spaces, which is basically their education space and education management and their Gen AI offering to generate lesson plans for you. ChatGPT has a student GPT just for students to develop stuff. So what's happening is that when they have the general purpose, these types of things, they're now actually saying, well, for education, because we're going after that, we're going to develop these specially trained models that are much more specific. Okay. So what they're doing is they're doing a lot of this prompt engineering at the back end, and they're uh, tailoring the, the large language model for particular things, depending on the area. They can improve the accuracy and improve the ground. And grounding is things like referencing, where is, what's the original document, how you can check it out, all that. They're improving that in four different ways. Prompt engineering is, is what I said about the prompt. You know, give it an instruction. Uh, ChatGPT, look, you, um, I'm going into an interview. I want you to ask me all the questions that you would for a, a uh, software engineer working in the area of uh, education um, and educational theories. And it will start interviewing you. Okay, 
as if as, as if it was the in interview. Um, so that's kind of prompt engineering. Retrieval augmented generation. You have it on the next slide. Um, it's prompt engineering. Sorry, I, I, I missed out one thing. So with prompt engineering, the other thing that it's doing is it can actually become, um, in education, we understand personalized. We know that everyone doesn't learn the same way. Everyone has different background information. What you're also able to do is add that user information to the agent at runtime. So now what it's doing in the back end, it's actually personalizing the prompts for that particular learner. So now instead, it, the, the learner thinks it's asking the general questions, but it knows what that learner knows and doesn't know and is actually producing responses that are much more tailored to that individual learner. Second thing is what we call uh, RAG or retrieval generated augmented generation. And I won't go into the technical details of this, but basically what it says is if I have content that I'd like the uh, language model to, to use, I can convert that into vectors and then pass it into the language model at runtime, and the language model will favor that content and produce responses based on that content. Think about it. For enterprises, that's how you get the answers more specific to your enterprise. For education, that's how you get it to be more specific to a curriculum or a content area or anything that you're trying to teach. What you do is you take those documents, they can be any sort of documents, it can be PDFs, doc whatever, and there's a whole uh, open source uh, um, set of software that can convert that into a, a, a vector. You search at runtime and you pop it in. Where the, where the uh, big companies are competing now is how much of this information can you send in a prompt? And that's the boards who say, how many tokens can you send? But that's where that's coming from, okay? Um, and they're all getting larger and larger and larger. They call it a context window. There's lots of different words for it. Um, but it's where they're competing now. So this is one built by one of my students. This was three months effort. Okay. This is a personalized tutor for teaching uh, SQL. Right? So what I, what I set him out to do was, I said, I want you to build me a chatbot which will be able to teach somebody about SQL. SQL is a, programming, uh, is a database language, it's a fully programming language as well. Um, but by the way, I'd like it personalized. So I'm going to give you profiles of fictitious students, and you're going to uh, be able to answer questions for them. Again, all he did, we, well, all he did, he was a student. Uh, we embedded a whole set of books, open source books on, on, on SQL. We um, had a user model. We embedded it. And we used, in this case, we used um, a GPT 3.5, GPT 4, and another open source um, model. And we compared the results and which ones were. But that gives you an idea of just what this thing can do. And that was only three months with a final year student. Last place, sometimes you want to do more. Sometimes it's not just enough to be able to hand it at runtime to, to the language model. What you want to do is you want to actually adapt the learning, the, the language model for your particular area. We call that fine tuning. Um, and this is where you actually retrain the model. So you have your big foundational model, you have your enterprise or your educational uh, uh, content, and you run it through the, the, the training. Now that uses a lot more CPU, a lot more uh, effort, more expense, more, uh, more, much more effort. Training or fine tuning, it's more of an art than a science because you've got to do some balancing and so forth, but it's still very doable. Um, and you end up with a fine trained large, large language model. And then here's a case study, which uh, one of my students did, uh, where we had it fine tuned, embedded. So we did everything we did with RAG, but we also had a fine tuned model and it was producing results that was almost comparable to 3.5. And that was just using an open source foundation model. So you can really improve the performance of the responses this way. The question you're probably asking me is, I'm not a computer scientist, why are you telling me this? So what's happening in the industry is this. Some of the companies are basing their model of, well, I'm gonna use GPT 4.5, or I'm gonna use Google or whatever. Others are saying, you know what, I need all of this behind my firewall. I can't afford to give away all my content and so forth. So I'm gonna use an open source uh, large language model, and I'm gonna fine tune it with my content and be able to offer it that way and then be able to stand over it. 
And that's what's going on at the moment in the industry. Comparison, fine tuning works better if you have better performance where the model needs to learn complex patterns and relationships. RAG is useful if there's a good choice of tasks and well labeled and, and the data is not scarce, you have a good amount of the data. So where is this going in the future? Okay, so if, you, if, this, if this didn't blow your mind, wait for VR AR, because you're gonna meet avatars you don't you know are not real because they're going to be talking to you in the digital world and you won't know, okay? Now, legally, thanks to uh, the AI Act, you're not allowed to do that um, unless you're not in Europe. Um, but this is what's going to happen. So you, we're going to see Gen AI in VR, AR, uh, as, you know, inhabiting. I was talking to one person and said, oh yeah, well, I was using it for my class and, 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 in summer, and one of them couldn't make it, so he sent his avatar instead. And the avatar presented for him. It's happening, okay? Um, Small models, uh, this is one of the areas that John researches, these are huge models. They are burning up uh, rainforests. What we're actually doing in research was taking these big models and decanting them into much smaller models, which are sp for specific purposes. And then they're much easier to handle. More than that, what one of our, our academics is doing is he's taking them and embedding them into devices. So your camera never has to send the data about anyone else. What it does, it has the AI in the camera and is detecting and doing whatever it needs to do in the camera. So people are beginning to, to look at how these can be embedded in devices. Hybrid approach to Gen AI, uh, human interaction. Yes, you, you will have avatars. Yes, we will have um, bots, for want of a better word, uh, uh, representing us. Um, in meetings in the future and so forth. A little bit further away, but, but getting there. Um, ethical and trustworthy issues are still a massive problem. And AI governance is the real... AI governance at the moment, we're focusing on the data. Because if you control the data, you control a lot of the algorithms uh, and how they're used. But there's a lot more needed and there's a lot of research uh, going in there. Um, the other part that people are only beginning to realize is that I keep on talking about one agent and a user using an agent. What actually is going to happen is you'll have multiple agents and they're gonna pass your request between them because they all do different things. So instead of having one helper, you have a team. Um, and now finally then we're seeing, as I said before, the Gen AI being uh, folks in different domains. So for example, health and wellness, education, social media. I'm involved in a startup um, which is looking at uh, companions for older age people uh, who want to stay in their home as they get older. Um, and what we're doing is we're using Gen AI to actually have that conversation with them on a daily basis, to have connection and so forth, to, be able to understand, and, and because they will survive and, and flourish much better within their own home than in a nursing home. That's fact. So we're seeing these kind of applications come out now. Um, now, they need to be properly regulated, they, and the regulation has only been put in place. They need to be properly governanced. That is still an open issue. They need to be more transparent. You need to know you're talking to an agent. Um, and they need to be much more better explaining um, and so forth. The last part is, it's like when we first went on the web. Don't believe everything you're told. The same applies with, 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 with Gen AI. Gen AI will get it wrong. It won't necessarily maliciously get it wrong, but it will be very convincingly wrong. So it does mean that you have to be uh, careful in terms of it. Um, and even the little disclaimers they put on the bottom of the screen isn't enough. So conclusions, they're really powerful. They provide a very natural interface. If you can speak, if you can talk, if you can communicate, you can do is use Gen AI. Um, but they are prone to hallucination. They are, can be inaccurate. Uh, they cannot be biased. Uh, there are ethical and legal risks we have to look at. There are challenges in the control and localization of it. And there are costs and data uh, sustainability issues. Hopefully that was useful. Thank you so much.